have just come back from that part of England nearest the Nazis, the part that's called the front line. The cliffs of Dover, high, austere bulwarks of defense. Only two years ago, they represented home and safety to the deserted British Army at Dunkirk. Was it only two years ago when we saw the little ships creep in under the shelter of these cliffs and land the tattered, dirty, but still cheery British Expeditionary Force? Was it only two years ago that the British behind these cliffs trained and drilled while the factories worked and sweated to replace the arms that had to be left behind? It seems an old story now, but it was only two years ago. Behind these cliffs, Britain stood alone at bay. And as we know now, with nothing much beyond a high courage and a resolve to die with its boots on, the British people awaited the blow they knew must fall. And so it was with no surprise that in those drowsy August days of 1940, the inhabitants of Dover heard the droning buzz of German bombers. This is it, they said, and went on with their allotted work. And then the few to whom we owe so much smashed the Germans from the sky, and the front line became a graveyard for German airplanes and German corpses. All this is old history now, but the front line is still there. The cliffs still look across at German France. What's it like in the front line country now? It looks much the same, except that the shattered aircraft have long since gone, and their flyers are buried in the little village cemetery, or in the fresh fields where the grass has long since covered the marks of their destruction. Does this mean that the front line, in peacetime called the Garden of England, has cleared up its war damage, buried its dead, and gone to sleep again? Certainly not. The front line of Britain is still very much alive. And what's more, it's got a new spirit. It no longer says, this is it, or here they come. It says, look out, Jerry, here we come. It's maybe taken us those two years, but the front line is all set to be the United Nations jumping off board. Britain's garden is going to dish it out. Here's some people who'll tell you all about it. This is one of the places where Navy men and soldiers are training for invasion. These flat-bottom, armor-plated craft are assault landing craft, which together with other similar types of vessels are Britain's invasion barges. Round our front line, Britain has accumulated a vast fleet of these boats, and someday a new armada will sail. But this one will be going the opposite way to the last. Of course, they've been used already. Listen to Abel Seaman Fletcher. When I first started making these raids on enemy territory, I had to put the pongos ashore in the rowing boat. What do you mean by pongos? Oh, pongos are what the sailors call the soldiers. And here is Lieutenant John Lewis. We have craft here that have been used at the Foden, Barzo, Grunewald, and Boulogne. Our training is purely offensive. We take commandos and blokes like that on the other side on reconnaissance raids. The journey over and the landing itself is not much. But the worst part is waiting to take the soldiers off. What we have done so far is real small fry. But we are now waiting to show you what we can do in a real big way. But the frontline country is not just waiting to have a go at Hitler. It's preparing. It's a vast camp. Everywhere are convoys. On the quiet hills, tank squadrons maneuver and rehearse. Britain's citizen army, tough now and equipped with the finest weapons from the home and American factories, is putting the final polish to its training. And the defensive jobs are now largely taken by women. Here's a mixed anti-aircraft battery practicing. Casualties from bombs and splinters. Not as many as the Germans have had from our guns. Hey, target! Play! 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 Play
But what of the civilians who are still in the camp? They've been carrying on as well as the services. Let's go and have a look at Dover. Well, it's here, all right. A few more houses down, though. The old Grand Hotel, where we reporters waited for Hitler, has gone. And the Burlington stopped one, too. But the Salvation Army is still here, and playing as well as ever. And there's the mayor out taking a stroll. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon, my daughter. Tell us about Dover, Mr. Mayor. Dover's quite all right, as I told you last time. We are all very busy doing our jobs and looking after troops. We have our problems and our tragedies. They still have their tragedies. Driven from the inland towns by night fighters, the Nazi bombers that were to blast Britain into subjection are now forced to make hit-and-run raids on harmless seaside towns. Scuttling across the channel, they drop their bombs at random and then make for home. But despite it all, the innate optimism and cheerfulness of the English man or woman in the street prevailed. Back at Dover, I met what I think is a typical inhabitant, Mrs. McEwen. I think you folks would like to meet her. Well, what do you want me to do this time? Just tell the folks what life is like in the front line. Well, it's been pretty much the same. Plenty of bombing and shelling. You've got used to that now. If it's got your name on it, you'll get it. The only thing that's really worrying me is, although the rations are being cut, I haven't got any slimmer. That's the spirit of the front line. After two years of bombing and shelling, she still laughs and thinks of her figure. But there's a reason for her cheerfulness. She knows that now, for every bomb or shell she dodges, the Germans try to dodge half a dozen. Mrs. McEwen symbolizes the optimistic spirit, which is the most striking feature of Britain today. Let them do their worst. They'll get it back. But it's what's happening in the air over the front line that really keeps the Mrs. McEwen's cheery. For months, every time she heard the drone of squadrons, she knew without looking up that it was the enemy. But now she knows just as instinctively that such a drone means that they're ours. Every day, every night, the sky above the front line is full of aircraft, and all busy bashing the box. Let's visit the front line aerodrome. Here's Flight Lieutenant Johnston, BAFC, back from his 68th sweep. Any claims, Johnny? Uh, 109 destroyed, buddy, yes. Oh, good, sir. Where about is this? Uh, just inside Dunkirk, about 30,000 feet. Don't see that. So, what's the story? Well, we were bound from the sun by it. Four, five, one, oh, nines. Half a bit of the shambles I've got on the tail of one. What range? Oh, up to 50 yards. Cannon and machine gun. And I saw his engine on fire and large pieces from the main plane. Well, that seems to one confirmed anyway. Thanks, pal. And here's Wing Commander Manal, who leads a Sterling squadron. He's just back from Cologne. Piece of cake, old boy. We waltzed over, dropped them on the target, waltzed back again and never saw a thing. And so it goes on. By day, fighter and bomber sweep. Spitfires for high and medium cover and hurricanes for close escort. Blenheims and Boston bombers. Blasting factories and powerhouses supplying the Germans. Shooting up freight trains and gun sites. Hurricane bombers and Beaufort torpedo planes smashing convoys. Huge four-engine Lancasters setting out for the heart of Germany. Wellingtons, Manchesters, and Sterlings off to smash German industry, just as Hitler's invasion fleet was smashed. For two years now, the war has ebbed and flowed across the front line. The Royal Air Force has started to flow. With Britain's 1,000 a night raid, it has become a flood. And that's what the heroic people of the front line have been waiting for. Let Mrs. Swatheridge of Dover sum it up for you. We've been bombed. Dive bombs, high-level bombs, machine guns. Been through two invasions here. And the last lot we had, we had the house down about our ears. But we're still sticking it, and we're going to stick it before the boys go over the other side. Then we'll have a jolly good holiday, won't we, Father? Certainly will, Chum. <laughs>